Rule number one, don't open the door. I need a little more up top and a little less down below. Amber alert. Oh God, something's gonna happen, something's gonna happen, something's gonna happen. In orbit of Uranus. It smells. I don't even want to talk about it. Oh no, you love me, you know you love me. Just don't let it touch the, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> You know, that's great, but give me a little more. <laughs> why, why are you shooting at me? <laughs> You can't start the car. Johnny has the keys. Hello and welcome out there in podcast and YouTube land. You have reached Johnny Has the Keys, a YouTube channel and also originally a podcast and continuing podcast where two guys get together. We talk about horror, science fiction, key elements of a particular movie, things that influence the movie, where the ideas came from, and things that reminds us of or influences since then. We've been doing it for a few years now. We're so glad if you're new and joining us. Hey, welcome. We're glad to have you with us. We'd love to get in touch with you. So uh, if you might want to leave a comment below or subscribe so you know about what we're doing and all of that kind of stuff. If you're returning, of course, you know all that stuff, but we still would love to for you to review us, comment, let us know what you guys think. Um, we also have a web page, all that kind of stuff. We'll talk about that at the end. My name's David, uh, and I'm here with my good friend Tim, who's been silent this whole time and making fun of me in his mind. Uh, I'm Tim, just remembering that this is an unscripted podcast, and yeah, I'm watching duh. David unscripted. Un un unscripted, just, uh, uh, you know, ad-libbing. So uh, what have you been doing? What do you, where you been? What have you been? Oh, my goodness, goodness, goodness. Yeah. Um, goodness. Well, we are in, I've been trying to, I know this is, futile and i don't know why i do it but i kind of try to find something around the same period or the same genre subgenre in my genre week as the film we are covering uh, this specific. is not in the same subgenre but it is an older movie uh preceding okay. today's topic by i don't know nine years maybe something like that oh. i watched okay. a little movie on Turner Classic Movies called mm -hmm. It. <laughs> it? It. Oh, wait, that image is familiar. That kind of tree-looking golem thing. Yes. Um, I've seen it. that somewhere. I don't know why. <laughs> well, it was, it was a British oh, movie, right. but it was not a okay. Hammer movie. It was shot in the style of a Hammer movie. It was released in 1967. has nothing to do with Stephen King. So... Just get that out of your heads Just right now. It is not it the uh, mammoth that's, novel slash two. That's the original thing. Pennywise behind you. Is that <laughs> yeah, it, no. Really? <laughs> uh, this is it! Exclamation point. Very much like mm. them! Exclamation point. This movie came out in 1967. It is a totally bizarre British movie starring Roddy McDowell. Uh, mm. He's an assistant museum curator that can control a giant stone golem creature to do pretty much anything he wants, which is mostly murder. Um, <laughs> okay. He also has the mummified corpse of his mother in a chair in his house, a la Norman Bates. Uh, this is a subplot that is never even really touched upon. <laughs> it's just, you just got to take it for granted that he keeps mm -hmm. his mother's corpse in the house. Uh, the creature is completely indestructible. And at one point they use an atomic bomb against it. And it does it work. Okay, then. <laughs> it was written and directed by Herbert J. Le Leader or Letter, who was clearly like i said trying to imitate hammer horror movies he has done nothing else of note um a movie called the frozen dead which i've heard of but i don't know anything about um and like i said the synopsis is that he is uh, mcdowell is a frustrated assistant to the museum curator after a fire destroys much of the museum's warehouse the curator finds a grotesque statue in the ruins putting the mysterious figure on display Pym is increasingly unnerved, Pym, that's Roddy McDowell, by its mm. unearthly presence. As it's revealed, the statue is the fabled golem, like you said, or golem, and golem. the increasingly yeah. unhinged Pym harnesses its power for his own use. 
Um, <laughs> I couldn't find any ratings on this film, and I would not recommend it. Okay. I would not recommend it! <laughs> Exclamation it. point. <laughs> uh, I was pleased, though, because I had seen shots of this movie throughout my life in, like, horror movie omnibuses and had never seen it. So, as soon like you, recognized that creature a while ago. As soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, I got to watch this. Mm -hmm. so now I have. <laughs> so, are, so, are you suggesting maybe that our watchers or listeners should, uh, if they want a good golem story, they should go to the X-Files episode? Do you remember yeah, that? One? Yeah, uh, yeah. I would I would watch that before I would watch this again, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Even with Roddy McDowell. Was, sorry your genre week was disappointing sort of thing. Um, mine was fun, though, and you know this connection. I think um, uh, months and months and months and months ago, because I added it to my list then, we had a coming to get you, and I mentioned a new series that was coming on Apple TV Plus called silo when i mentioned it you knew immediately because i think you've read the novel that it was i didn't on. know immediately but when you started saying the story i recognized it they've changed the title correct Just, the, yeah. the 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 novel title was wool the, um, the original and then i think it became the silo trilogy or something right by yeah. a, a guy named hugh howie Mm -hmm. um, who was one of the big, I found out doing some research, was one of the big first self-published authors. He was. He like, uh, was a big Kindle guy when Kindle had just started. Amazon Kindle was kicked, and they did a lot of publicity for him and helped a lot. But he, you know, he's a self-published author, and that's his career and living. And he and pretty great. much lives on a boat now, I think. He sails around yeah. the world. Um, <laughs> uh, that's uh, No, awesome. it's like a sailboat. It's not like a big boat. Um, he and the guy that wrote The Martian were the two big ones I knew first mm. that self-published. Yep. Andy Weir is his name. Well, last last episode, we had dove a lot into dystopians and dystopian literature and everything else. And um, this is definitely in that genre. But I think you would really enjoy it and really like oh, it. Uh, I mean, I love the book. Basically, it is a... Um, for those of you who haven't read it or seen the series, uh, I highly recommend it. I really enjoyed it. Season one was really good. They have already uh, begun season two. Uh, it's not released yet, but I can't wait to watch it. Or I don't think it's released yet. Uh, I didn't. Uh, I just got to the finale the other day. How many episodes but, and what network? Uh, it is on Apple TV Plus. Okay. So uh, it's part <clears throat> of their, you know, the, the same thing with... Um, Oh, uh, what, what's his name? Lazo, uh, jo Laz Lazo, Laszlo. There's another series out that I haven't watched yet. It's a oh, Lass series. Um, Lasso. Ted Lasso. Yeah, Ted that's Lasso. It. Yeah, and uh, Morning Report or Morning Edition or whatever the Jennifer Aniston. The Morning series. Show. <laughs> uh, but I can't believe you have Apple TV and I don't, and I know these things. <laughs> well, I don't watch. I don't watch them. <laughs> So, you should. Uh, They're supposed to be really good shows. I, I've heard really good. And and if Silo is an indication, then yes, the uh, Apple TV Plus as a, quote, network or producing arm or streaming creator uh, is up there right with Netflix and Amazon Prime. They're doing mm -hmm. some really good work. Uh, the production design on this is incredible. The cast is amazing. And it's uh, Rebecca Ferguson is the lead. Common is in it. Tim Robbins. It's got a great cast. It's got a great story basically set literally, as it says, in a silo. It is an entire civilization in a post-apocalyptic world that lives in this giant, you know, 200 story tube, basically. And they have their own caste system, of course, in there and hierarchy and things to do. And it's very uh, political and dissident and rebels. And it's great, great dystopian literature. Is there a lot of steps? Oh, a lot of steps. It's As like a matter the, of fact, part of the rituals, it, them going up and down a lot of steps each day. If I'm not and, mistaken. Yeah, just going, that's their commute you know, is up and down steps to different levels because, mm -hmm. of course, the reactor and the power of the silo is at the bottom. Uh, the middle tier, the lower tiers are all the poor. The middle tiers are the middle class. The upper tiers are all the rich and elite, and that's where the cafeterias are and all of that. 
Uh, but they say, yeah, I, uh, at one point, if you really want to go to the depths, as they call it down below where the reactor is, it takes like half a day of going down steps. So uh, interesting the way they've done it and the subtext and the subplots and how they keep you interested episode to episode, really good, really well done and good storytelling. So I highly recommend it. Silo, Apple TV Plus. I think you can now get it anywhere. Like you can get it through, you can rent it on Apple or iTunes, that sort of That's thing. cool. Amazon Prime. So yeah. Very mm -hmm. cool. Well, yeah, as and, far as segues to our topic of the day. <laughs> steps, um, lots of, no. Well, uh, honestly, there are none, uh, except are for the none. fact that I talked about a movie that came out in 1967. And if you revert those letters, this movie came out in 1976. <laughs> There you there go. There you go. There's your segue. Good one. There's We're your talking segue. about a little movie that is a cherished movie of mine, probably not David's, called Burnt Offerings. What? Many people might not have heard of this movie. If you are of a certain age, you you might have heard of this movie. <laughs> If you are a certain of age as I am, you would even have heard of the novel. This was a very popular novel in the horror genre in the 1970s. It was written mm. by Robert Morasco. I actually went back and reread it for the third time before mm. we, okay, before watching for the podcast. Mm. Um, it is directed by Dan Curtis. He's another name that is very familiar to, like I said, people of mine and David's age. He was mm -hmm. huge in the 70s on television. Uh, Burn Offerings was one of a few, just a handful of movies he released for, you know, to the box offices or whatever, to the main movie theaters. Most of his stuff was television production. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he considers his biggest accomplishment the Winds of War miniseries and the War and Remembrance miniseries. David and I, well, I, the reason I say that is because my parents love both of those. But yeah, David and I know him for Shack, The Night Stalker, The Night Strangler, mm -hmm. Trilogy of Terror, <laughs> Dark Shadows. I mean, uh, tons and tons. Uh, he even did a, a television movie of Turn of the Screw that I have not seen, or if I have, I don't mm -hmm. remember it. Um, but this movie sticks out to me because I saw it on my 11th birthday with a friend of mine in a theater in Tennessee, mm. and I was blown away by it. it, it it's a haunted house story or, or kind mm. of a haunted house story. But at the time, I didn't really know that much about the cast. But going back and watching it now, I'm like, what a stellar cast this movie has. There are mm -hmm. a lot of great, uh, great people in it. Um, what, what is, you know, all right, first I'll give a, a quick little synopsis. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, the Rolfs are a family that live in the city. You don't see much of this in the movie, but they are, they have a tiny apartment and they're just looking for some relief and they rent a summer house in the country for uh, the summer. And they rent this from a, a rather odd brother and sister. Um, their last name is Allardyce. And the only catch is that uh, their mother will be there up in the this like room up in the attic. And she never comes out. You know, you just have to bring her her meals daily. And if you will be the caretaker of their mother, as well as the house for the summer, you get it for a really good deal, like 900 bucks. I think it was for the entire summer. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. uh, slowly, uh, well, the the Rolfs uh, are Marion and Ben and their son. Um, what was Davey. his name? David. And they bring their aunt, who is played by Betty Davis, with them. So it's the four of them in the house. And things start happening in the house. Uh, odd things that you would expect in a haunted house novel. And I'll just leave it at that. What? Is your first impression of this movie, or what was your first remembrance of this movie? When you added it to the list, I thought, I saw that. I remember seeing it maybe when it first aired, or maybe when it came out on VHS after it first aired. The only thing I can remember is Betty Davis having very big eyes and kind of screaming in pain, and the house shedding its outer 
layer. coating and yeah. and something with a chimney. That's all I could remember. I had no idea Oliver Reed was in it. No idea Karen Black was in it. Did not remember Davy, of course, at all, or Burgess Meredith, or you know. So, um, so I had no real memory of it other than kind of those two impressions were in my head, and I thought, oh, I've seen it. Never read the novel, um, mm -hmm. and so it was. It was interesting watching it again especially once i start because because the way i do mine is i'll just glance at a little bit of the production so who wrote it who directed it what year did it come out and what's the cast that's normally how i start before i even watch it and then i might read i might watch the trailer or not then i watch the movie just cold and see what happens um so it was very interesting going into it and suddenly boom oliver reed pops up and i go oh i really like oliver reed uh, oh, Karen Black. I like Karen Black. I think she's very limited, but I like what she does. What she does, she does well. Betty Davis, never been a big fan, but hey, you know, she's in it. So we'll see. Um, and it was it was interesting watching it. Would, would I say this is my favorite film? No. Would I recommend it? Maybe not. Uh, I think there are better ghost stories out there. Uh, I do think it has some unique stuff to it. And it's Dan Curtis, who I really, really like a lot. I mean, I would hazard to say that at, when we were growing up in the mid seventies and everything, Dan Curtis was like our Mike Flanagan. He had done Dark Shadows. He had done Dracula with freaking Jack Palance. All right. He had all of these television things that were scary. He was bringing scary to television. I was going to say lot. he's the television equivalent. <clears throat> but yeah, I guess well, we Mike didn't have Flanagan streaming. could be because streaming is the equivalent to television now, pretty much. So. Right. That's kind of what I meant was we didn't mm -hmm. have streaming, so we had to watch it where we could. And that was uh, and that was his mainstay. And it kind of shows in this movie. This movie is very television directed. Oh, if you think that's lit. if you think that you should go back and watch those two Dark Shadows movies he did night and house. Yes. Ooh. Yeah. Well, and I remember seeing those at the Princess Theater theatrically. So mm -hmm. I saw them in theaters, mm -hmm. but. Yeah, they came across it, except for the gore factor. They were very television. Yeah, uh, but I would this do a really double is. feature of them just be, just for the fun of it. <laughs> yeah, we should. This one, the, so so my takes on it. This one was was very um, television in the way it was directed. It was very television in the way it was scored. He had the same guy do the music that does almost all of his stuff. So it sounds very similar to his. And overall, I was just, there weren't any scares in it. There wasn't any surprise. I mean, Trilogy of Terror still scares me now. So he can, it's not that he can't do scary. I just, there wasn't any scary in this. Well, it's just all. one story in Trilogy of Terror that's scary. The other two are forgettable. Correct. The other two are free, totally forgettable. As a matter of fact, I couldn't tell you what they were right now. No. And, <laughs> and um, she plays like four parts in it. Um, that Karen Black, that is. But it's also written by William F. Nolan, who wrote the screenplay for this. Right. And Nolan, I found out, also did the Norless tapes, that one that I keep saying we need to watch. And that he is a Dan Curtis movie, too. <laughs> yep. So is Trilogy of Terror. He did that. But then this same year, Nolan did Logan's Run. So, right. you know, this went up against Logan's run in theatrical release. And I'm going, ooh, there's a huge comparison. <laughs> well, and I'd also like to to express that Nolan is he adapts them. I mean, like Trilogy yes. of Terror was really Richard Matheson. But I think Correct. William F. Nolan did the uh, screenplay, screenplay as yep. he did. You know, Robert Morasco wrote this novel and Nolan did the screenplay. Well, also, uh, so anyway, I guess that's a little bit of background on um the film and on Dan Curtis. Mm -hmm. Um before we move on to scenes, I was gonna see mm -hmm. if I had uh any in my production notes I have this was originally a screenplay. Uh Morasco wrote it as a screenplay, then novelized it, and then Nolan and Morasco re and Curtis re screenplayed it to do this. I don't know anything about that. <laughs> yep. I read that in two different sources to look it up just to make sure. So yeah, oh, okay. it was originally he had originally proposed it as a screenplay, had written it as a screenplay when it didn't get any attention, he novelized it. Okay, that makes so. sense then. Um because I have uh several directors that were attached to it before Dan Curtis. And that's probably why. Yep. Okay. 
Um, George Roy Hill was attached to it. Mm -hmm. We just covered a film of his called Slaughterhouse Five. He's a wonderful mm -hmm. director. It would have been interesting to see his take. Uh, Very Mark much Rydell so. was attached to it. Oh, um, interesting. He did on Golden Pond and The Rose. Uh, both were approached. Um, I mean, both were were interested, and then both passed on it. Um, and then one other person was attached to it for a while and even worked on a script. And you're going to be very surprised at who this is. Mm, okay. Bob Fosse. <laughs> really? Yes. Extraordinary really? choreographer and, you know. Theater, theatrical person. Right. Theatrical choreographer him. was attached to this. Um, and then I have somewhere, I don't, I can't find my notes. I'll find it later where someone said, you need to leave this alone. <laughs> so somebody just basically said, I would drop this and yeah, Bob walked away one. from it. Hey, Bob, go somewhere else. <laughs> That's yeah. how it all of a sudden landed in the hands of Dan Curtis, who was not as prominent as any of those directors, but was no. still, like you said, a qualified candidate to do a horror movie. So of course. Yeah. Um, great horror cred. The movie was filmed in 30 days in August of 1975. No sets were built. It's filmed entirely on location. And if you recognize that house, it's the exact same house that we spoke of in um, Phantasm, as yep. well as a bunch of other movies. That house is a very famous house. The exterior. Yeah, it's, the, it's the Dunsimuir house in Oakland, mm -hmm. California, I found out. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons... This movie sticks out to me is because it's one of the ones that Stephen King recommended in his book, Dance Macabre, back in the early 80s. Uh, this is one of his favorite, one of his favorite movies, or was at the time. I, I want to move on to scenes, but the one word that comes to mind when, for me choosing this movie, is mm -hmm. influence. There is a lot of influence it okay. resonates with influence so we'll get to that i'm sure in keys i'm sure um are there any scenes that stuck out to you no no um uh, i was gonna say there has to be <laughs> the the uh, i think if i had to categorize it by what i remember again the transformation scene when is it Ben, whoever Oliver Reed's character, yeah. when he mm -hmm. get when he gets up and goes to the window and sees the house with the roof shingles being replaced from within and the side paneling being replaced from within. That was it's kind like of, it's shedding its exterior, yeah, with a new one underneath, yeah, right. Which was interesting. I liked mm -hmm. that a lot. I thought the death scene essentially of Betty Davis was really good, even though she had no dialogue. Just she looked physically ill. She looked in pain. She looked terrified, mm -hmm. and it was. I thought it was really a great performance by her in that scene. Um, I think the face first into the windshield gore effect was really good as far as i remember that goes. as a kid because i i was always talking about that <laughs> oh his face yeah. went through a windshield <laughs> and dripping blood down you know as as davy screams there but i i mean the scenes that i remember most are the scenes that bugged me they just bothered me because there was so much that just didn't make sense to me i was really? going why why would people do this this movie i would definitely recommend to people for all of the wrong haunted house reasons. So, you know, it's that, it's that Eddie Murphy thing of, you know, you go into the house, it's beautiful, get out. Too bad we can't stay, let's get right. out. You know, you white people stay in the haunted houses. And, you know, there's telegraph stuff coming from the very beginning of this movie. And you go, no, just leave. It's but the reason leave. they stay is because of the attachment of Karen Black. Right. Yeah. And that needs to, you just, you need to knock her out and take her <laughs> in the car with you and get out. Something bad uh, is happening. He, they basically in the novel get, they basically are getting a divorce before the end of the summer. And, well, he, was, and Ben takes Davy and leaves her there, but they good. end up coming back for a weekend to see if they can patch things up. And that's when, all hell breaks loose and they die. See, I think that would have been stronger. 
I think that would have been much. The, let me ask you some things, and maybe they're in the novel, but they're not mm-hmm. in the movie or blah, 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 whatever. I think it would have been interesting, even if it was a two-scene little quick thing, kind of like in Stepford, which is one of my keys, um, if we saw their life before. So if we saw their little tiny apartment in New York and saw them divorce-esque and struggling and all of that, and then suddenly, oh, we're here. Oh, it's big. It's huge. It's palatial. Of course, we're going to do that. You know, and even if they started with the same hook they did with them driving, because it was very shining at the opening of just that we're driving up to the mansion kind of thing. Um, And then they meet the weird sister, I mean, the weird brother-sister duo and kind of make the arrangement, but they haven't decided. Then cut to them back in their tiny apartment struggling. And then they say, yes, we need to do that. I think. That would have helped. I think them leaving and then returning, and that's when the last gas stranglehold happens. That would have been better because there's no backstory for any of they, them. They filmed it, and it was a slog, so they cut it. Well, yeah, it's, well, I've it's, got my- it's in the book, but they they it's just um, Curtis was like, "This is boring. We need to cut to the house and get them there faster." So interesting, yeah. I think, I mean, yes, I do think his pacing is really bad in, in most of this movie. But I mean, because my, my first two watch notes are everything is shot from this very low angle, like almost below the chest. That's very TV. And that's really, it doesn't work. And the second note is, well, okay, now we're up to the pool scene and I still have no notes. So I'm kind of bored. <laughs> oh. But anyway, um, but there's no backstory on the house either, other than. Mom's upstairs, take care of her. She takes care of her collection, which we found out is a collection of pictures. And Karen Black's character notices the pictures are of all different ages, which is kind of interesting. But we don't get any, there's no backstory. There's no person. There's no. Well, I mean, some of that I like. Some of that ambiguity to me is enticing. We've talked about this before, how it's not, sometimes it's better if things are not explained to you. <clears throat> I I agree as long as there's an an, an eventual payoff. So well, well, let me ask you. Maybe I misinterpreted the, the windshield. <laughs> maybe I misinterpreted. Is the payoff that well is the subtext that the house gains energy from people? Yeah. So it's taking when Grandma dies, the flowers bloom, or Auntie dies, the flowers bloom. And when David but, almost dies, things start happening too. David's the youngest. Dave, yes. Well, okay. in the pool when the father attacks him. R- right, which I didn't understand. Why is the why is he attacking him? Or can the can the house take over people? I, I just don't see. I, I maybe I missed stuff because. And then at the end, I was going, okay. So did it take over? Karen? So that, was there never a a, a a woman upstairs? I think the there was, just- but I think she died. And I think the Allardyces were continuing to feed the house, and as a result, got a new mom. So they get every few years or whatever, they get a new mom, a dad that's sacrificial, and hopefully a a child that's sacrificial because that gives more. I mean, I'm not sure if this to the house. <laughs> I'm not sure if this the couple scenario with a child and an aunt is the same thing every time. But yes, I would say this is cyclical. Well, I mean, the way that one actress interprets the way the sister says, and there's a boy, there's a child, right? You know, she was like really eager, and I was going, "Ooh, human sacrifice!" I, I can see that. Okay, <laughs> cool. Uh, but I mean, I think that the house, like many haunted houses, uh, does feed on their energy as well as manipulating their fears, the fears they have. Like that, I didn't get that. At all. Yeah the the whole Ben story of seeing the chauffeur of the hearse. And what does that mean? When he was a and- child. <laughs> What, 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 <laughs> that's what his that? biggest fear that's been his fear since he was a kid so the house well, could, uses that against well, him. i could tell because we have five minutes of a close-up of oliver reed shaking so yes i you know i know that he's afraid of it i just don't know. oh i see what you're saying okay why <laughs> and 
you know, I mean, I've got notes all the way through here about Oliver Reed is a very facial actor, isn't He's he? Great. And then I've got later on, Oliver Reed is wincing again. Um, you know, so I, I just, I, again, I don't mind not knowing and that kind of propels you into the mystery and the plot and the da 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 as long as by the end of it go oh now i understand why you know in poltergeist oh it was buried on a a, an indian burial mound that makes Mm -hmm. sense okay great this one to me i i didn't get that at the end sorry so and um a lot of the stuff they left out or they didn't leave out but they touch upon lightly is the fact that pretty much once they get there she stops having sex with him yeah, that and would have been important to show. That ends something. up being majorly important. And there is the one scene where he is almost raping her, and he finally backs off and and says, what's wrong? You know, when did I become so repulsive? And she's like, right. oh, you're not. You're sexy. And he's like, yeah, whatever. You're, you're giving me some BS. <laughs> But that's that's pretty important in the book as well. It's a fairly, I think it's a pretty faithful adaptation to the book, actually. Leaving that's aside the, point, the stuff, um, my scenes that would stick yes. out um, would be the swimming pool scene immediately, because why all of a sudden is he almost drowning his own son? Yes, and it is. I mean, it's quite clearly something. I mean, clear to me that something is possessing him. You know, all of a sudden well, it's getting out of hand and he doesn't stop. And well, that kid is being held the underwater. You know, he finds the glasses first, the he little does. round glasses. Then he starts kidding around with Davy wearing the glasses. Mm-hmm. And then they start horsing around. So I thought, okay, possession through object, I could get that, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And later on, I'm going to find out that, you know, the old lady was killed by her husband in the pool or something. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be cool, but I never did. I, I don't, well, to me, it's not necessary. <laughs> I know. I understand. <laughs> um, another scene would be the end scene when he does turn the chair around and Mrs. Allardyce is actually his wife with gray hair. And that's another thing in the book is her hair is continuing to go gray and she's very vain about it. She's very upset about it. But mm-hmm. by the end, it's completely white and she turns around and it doesn't even look like Karen Black. It looks like an old lady in that chair. Right. Yep. Mrs. Bates. Mm. Yeah, actually, that's a very good reference, too, now that I think about it. Um, What else? As far as those two scenes immediately come to mind, the transformation scene. Um, Actually, one scene that really impressed me this time around was the Allardyces themselves. I forgot how good Burgess Meredith and Eileen Heckhart are. It's yeah. those two. Extremely memorable, really good lines. The way he plays it is really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Both yeah, he of- almost plays it gay. And I was yes. like, wow, I never picked up on that before. But th- mm-hmm. now I do, of course. You know, when I was 11, that was a different story. Um, mm-hmm. Very much so. So anyway, those are the scenes that stick out to me. Um, did you have any other info nope. you wanted to pass on before we go to cast no and i don't have any trivia i mean i just got uh, all of my watch notes are basically questions you know why is he british and why do we never address that who the hell is this chauffeur uh, and that he is not british in the book i think that was just you know wow we got oliver reed you know we're going to use him because yeah. he's such a good actor anyway um and I don't know if he had a reputation by that point. He probably did because, you know, he he was known for being very volatile and drunk a lot. Uh, Betty Davis hated him. Hated yeah, he him. definitely had substance abuse issues. Um, yeah. But uh, but I mean, he he went on to still continue his career. I mean, I, I think yeah. his last wasn't Gladiator. His Gladiator was his last. And he he at one point was drunk and running down the streets of Italy naked before he died. Yeah. There you go. Uh, so. He, he, um, he was a functioning alcoholic. I guess that's the best way to put it. Yeah. Best way. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, they said that, you know, you have a few drinks with him. He's a blast, but once he hits that seventh drink, forget it, get out of there. <laughs> Basically <laughs> is what people say. Get out quick. Yeah. 
Um, the thing that, well, I mentioned the fact that this cast is stellar. Um, it stars two Oscar winners, Betty Davis and Eileen Heckhart. I mentioned Eileen Heckhart for um, my genre week topic a couple of weeks back. She was in The Bad Seat. She was one of those Oscar winners that was uh, from The Bad Seat. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, uh, well, no, I'm t- I take that back. She was nominated for The Bad Seat. She won for Butterflies Are Free. Um, and two Oscar nominees, Karen Blatt was nominated for Five Easy Pieces and Burgess Meredith, of course, for Rocky and Day of the Locust. So lots of uh, pedigree here as far as uh, cast. Um, mm-hmm. We know Karen Blatt, like you said, she she's a quirky actress with not a lot of range, but she can play. Well, I mean, she can get Oscar attention. So I guess she's got more range than we're giving her credit for. Um, she was an easy writer. That was like one of her first big breaks. Uh, she mm-hmm. got noticed, though, in Five Easy Pieces with Jack Nicholson. Um, mm-hmm. She was in Nashville and come back to the five and dime Jimmy Dean, Jimmy Dean, which is a particular favorite of mine. Mm-hmm. Uh, then she went on in the 90s or 2000s to do House of a Thousand Corpses, that Rob Zombie movie. Ugh. <laughs> yeah, well, but. She was also in Trilogy of Terror. She was in Alfred Hitchcock's last movie, Family Plot, and my personal favorite, Airport 75. I can't fly this plane. <laughs> um, that's another I movie. I think it I was interesting, it too, because she was like a Meg Foster or a Barbara Hershey or whatever. It just mm-hmm. had such a unique look facially mm-hmm. and very memorable look. So right. um, when even if it was a bad movie or whatever, she was a adequate in it and B, she just had a look that you remembered. Uh, so. It also helps that you and I had a friend in common that looks a lot like her. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> the Oswald. Yep. Yes. Yep. Um, okay. So that's enough about Karen Black. She is the, the matriarch, obviously, of this small family. Oliver Reed is the patriarch. We know Oliver Reed, uh, other than being a volatile drunk actor, for movies like Hammer's Curse of the Werewolf. Uh, My favorite werewolf movie. Yeah. Several Ken Russell movies, including Women in Love, The Devils, mm-hmm. um, Tommy. And then he was rediscovered in the 80s for a movie, I think, called Castaway, where he got a lot of attention. And then, mm-hmm. as you said, he his final film was Gladiator with Russell Crowe. Uh, Burgess Meredith, it, I always consider Burgess Meredith a character actor. Would you? Yes. I mean, he never really does leads, but he makes very memorable side characters. Well, the only time he really, I can remember if you said what's Burgess Meredith's lead was the Twilight Zone episode. And it was also incredible, uh, very memorable. And the the one that, y- you know, a lot of people mention as one of their favorites. Uh, yeah, it's but- called Time Enough at Last. Right. But other than that, no, he was always the, you know, he's Rocky's manager, for God's sake. He's Rocky's coach or whatever. Yeah. And he's also the penguin on Batman. I mean, that's everyone remembers him from that. Um, But he started acting in 1935 and had 184 credits before he died. That's Um, great. You mentioned Rocky. He did tons of television, including Mm -hmm. Penguin and that Twilight Zone episode. Um, Mm -hmm. He's just, he's amazing. And I love him in this movie. He's got one scene and basically steals the show. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Rocky came out this same year, too, which I thought was interesting. Oh, yeah, that's right. It did. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Eileen Heckhart is a stage actress. Um, Mm -hmm. I mentioned that when I talked about her in The Bad Seed. Um, She is another, though, one of those continuing character actors like Burgess Meredith, who was uh, in movies as recent as uh, The First Wives Club. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't remember what she did in that. I just happened to read that. So she's she's been around for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Um, Lee Montgomery, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. He played David Rolfe, the son. Uh, He was a child actor that never really made the transition to an adult actor. He stopped acting in like the 80s. Mm -hmm. Um, But we know him from another double feature that we need to do uh, from the movie Ben, which is the sequel to Willard. We should Mm -hmm. probably cover those in a double feature. Yeah, Um, we should. Yeah. 
Uh, but that's that's pretty much it. Very familiar face from the seventies, but no longer. Yes, yes, yeah, agreed. He was uh, like and then the, you know the kid actor that you would see on a commercial or something. Go, oh yeah, I know that one. <laughs> and then he's gone. You know? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, or on any television show of the week for sure. Yes. Uh -huh. Um, Dub Taylor, another familiar place face plays um. Walker, the caretaker, the the Mister Dudley of the story. <laughs> Very good at the allegory there. Yes, right. Um, uh, he was a character actor with two hundred and sixty two credits, even more than Burgess Meredith. Uh, in movies like The Getaway and The Wild Bunch, very very familiar face. I couldn't really tell you anything else he's done though. And boy, um, he the, just chewed every scenery around him. Uh, in, in all three scenes he's in yeah <laughs> it's just yeah and and it's clear in the book that the Allard Ice character does not like him and it's clear in the movie that Burgess Meredith didn't like him either true true <laughs> yeah um the most famous person in this movie is of course your beloved Betty Davis <laughs> um I picked this intentionally because I know David hates Betty Davis. I don't understand why, but he does. I don't hate <laughs> Betty Davis. I just don't like Betty Davis. There's a difference. Well, you know, I, I recorded Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte the other day because I haven't seen it in a while. And I was thinking we really need to do Baby Jane for an episode. Baby Jane, she's <laughs> great in. That's a great movie. Dark <laughs> Victory. She's great in Dark Victory. I think that's a great movie too. But then she started playing off of that, you know, she and not Catherine Hepburn, because she's like the Meryl Streep. Crawford, yeah. yeah. Both of them just started playing off the fame, and they're just doing that same thing every uh, month. No, month. actually, they weren't playing off the fame. They were old and not able to be cast, so they had to go to genre. That's that Well, be, yeah. You've got that wrong. <laughs> I can tell you that, well, because and, they and were maybe both. Maybe I haven't seen enough of her stuff, yeah. you know, because- I well, and I also recorded more. a movie the other day called Dead Ringer that's supposed to be really good with her in it. It's a mm -hmm. horror movie as well. Okay. But anyway, they they, right. they became um Robert Aldrich kind of rescued them from obscurity in the sixties, early uh late no, early sixties, late sixties. Anyway, th that's because a they were big, for another day. <laughs> they were big 40 actors, right? 40s? Yes. Well, yes, they okay. were prominent in the 40s. Actually, um, I think Joan Crawford may have even done some silent films. Um, wow. Okay. They're, they're, they're right. pretty old. So, but, but but most of their stuff, their their heyday was the 30s and 40s. Okay. Um, Betty Davis detested Oliver Reed, referring to him as that man. <laughs> <laughs> that man. Uh, she only spoke to them when they shared on screen dialogue. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, after filming, she described him as possibly one of the most loathsome human beings she has ever had the misfortune of meeting. <laughs> Dang. But she was a bit dramatic. I will give you that. I mean, mm -hmm. so she could have been uh, playing that up a little bit. Um, uh, maybe. Anyway, as we've already mentioned a lot of her past fame, and uh, I think she's great in this. Like you said, I mean, she is very convincing when she is dying. She looks like she is really dying in this movie. Well, and to her credit, too, I will also say I really liked her two early scenes, the scene in the car and the two scenes when she's painting and talking to Davey and talking to the family. She just mm -hmm. seems like I'm the caring aunt and I love this family. And especially if you're saying she didn't get along with Oliver Reed, she didn't you didn't see that in the performance. And that says a lot. So that was really good. And I thought she was really strong in those parts. That's why I was kind of sad when, when she did die or when she started, she really started losing it when she got tired that one day. And then it was like she, her energy was being sucked away. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and then she comes down and admits that she maybe have turned the, she put the blanket on Davy and that immediately makes, you know, Karen Allen, I mean, uh, sorry, um, uh, Karen Black. accuse her, Karen Black accuse her of, you know, of turning on the gas or whatever. And I was going, right. okay, that was a jump to conclusion, but okay, you're, it's the house talking through you. I can see that. Okay. Folks out there, there's a scene <laughs> where Davey almost dies because his room is closed and the gas, there's a gas leak. And yep. Betty Davis 
um, as the aunt is confused because she had said goodnight to him, but she doesn't remember shutting the door. And immediately Karen Black thinks, oh, she's senile. She accidentally tried to kill him or something. I don't know. It's very, uh, right. very much drama. Um, very much drama. The, the yes. other scene I would I would call Betty out on, though, is the pool scene where she's genuinely concerned that Ben is hurting David. And she's like standing up and like yelling at mm -hmm. him and saying, stop yep. it. But, you know, I, I don't know. She can't jump in the pool and stop him, but she she does what she can. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, there is one other character in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be the character of the creepy chauffeur, or what I would call the hearse driver. The uh, tall man first. of this movie, yes. Uh, yeah, okay. he is a, a childhood fear of Ben's that Ben remembers from going to a funeral as a child. Uh, he's played by Anthony James. Did he look familiar to you? Yeah, I've seen him in a bunch of stuff. Uh, yeah. In the 60s, he was in television a lot. In the well, 60s. he was in Westerns with Clint Eastwood. He was in Hyde yeah. Plains Drifter and Unforgiven. Um, he was a character actor as well and died in 2020. Yeah, he almost always plays some creepy bad guy. I mean, it's just uh, what Yeah, he did actually, <laughs> two years after this movie, he co-starred with Betty Davis in Return from Witch Mountain. <laughs> Ooh, Dis well. Disney movie. So he was probably a bad guy in that, too. It wouldn't surprise me. Um, but that's all I have on cast. Um, the awards I have for this, um, it won three awards from the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror. They gave it Best Horror Film in 1977, Best Supporting Actress, Betty Davis, and Best Director, Dan Curtis. Um, it won three awards from the Sickest Canada. Uh, Catalonian International Film Festival. I've mentioned that before. It's in Spain. Mm -hmm. It won Best Director, Best Actress, Karen Black, and Best Actor, Burgess Meredith. I think it's funny that one gave it to Betty Davis. The others gave it to Karen Black and Burgess Meredith. Uh, the movie is not on the 1001 Movies You Must See Before You Die list, and I agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, however, I do think this is an important movie, uh, again, as I said, because of its influence. Well, if we want a Burgess Meredith movie, let's do magic. Oh, I uh, it's on the list, and I recorded okay. it, too. I told you I've been okay. recording a ton of stuff while I recorded it the other day, too. All right. That's yeah. good. Um, any uh, trivia before we move on to keys? Mm, nope. Okay. I mean, I, I have no trivia other than the fact that it was very interesting that all these parallel things were coming out the same year, like Rocky came out the same year, Logan's Run came out the same year, uh, The Omen came out this year. Um, so that was kind of, of interesting in 76, uh, mm -hmm. that the novel was a screenplay first. That's in my trivia. And then and the I rest didn't of put it down just, what year that novel came out, but I think it was around 74, around the same yeah. time Carrie came out. Um. I have one trivia note that I'm going to uh, mention just because I know it's wrong. Um, <laughs> apparently, <laughs> the uh, off IMDb, the haunting flashbacks that Rolf has about the creepy chauffeur are not mm -hmm. based on anything in the original Morasco novel, but were an actual childhood experience of Dan Curtis. That's total bullshit. This guy makes a, four appearances in the novel. <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> yes. So I'm like, why would he lie about that? Are you because saying he we wanted can't to trust stuff we read? Say on the I internet? contributed this to you know this nightmare to the movie or whatever. Anyway, well, or maybe it came up in an interview somewhere with somebody else. I think what it that. is is it's just coincidence that he had the same fear because he said it was being at his mother's funeral and seeing the chauffeur laughing outside the funeral parlor disturbed him. Oh, okay. So, well, I just think it's something they had in common, but this this is definitely not added for the movie. It is in the novel because, mm. like I said, I just read it. Um, right, and then. then I have one thing that says, read this verbatim. So brace yourself, folks. I've got a paragraph. <laughs> this film and the previous year's highly rated ABC TV movie trilogy of terror shared many of the same personnel, including lead actress Karen Black, director producer Dan Curtis, and William F. No Nolan, aided by Curtis on Burn Offerings, which was based on the novel by Robert Morasco. While on trilogy, the original author of the three 
featured stories, Richard Masson wrote the third story teleplay and Nolan scripted the other two. Okay. I had that wrong. So they, they kind of co screenwriting screenplay. Mm -hmm. Um, Associate producer, Robert Singer score composer, Bob Cobert in the case of trilogy, recycling his music from the earlier Dan Curtis TV movies, the night stalker and the night strangler and actor Oren Cannon, who played the minister in offering and the motel clerk in trilogy. So anyway, I guess what I'm trying to say is we mentioned earlier that there are some parallels with Curtis and Flanagan. Well, Mm -hmm. it's, it's the fact that they also use the same crews and the same people a lot too, I think is another key to my Flanagan. So, because in my notes and trivia, I came across the 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 uh, the uh, uh, the orchestrator, the the music director for it, and he had done all of Dark Shadows, and had done Dracula with him as well. Okay. So, and I, I actually watched that musical Dracula. Com- conductor, musical composer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I mentioned it a, a few seasons back, but I watched that Palance Dracula a few years ago. I did too. It's, it's decent. It's not it's bad. Not bad. <laughs> No, He's better than you bad. think he would be. <laughs> Jack Pounds. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a cross between him and Charlton Heston. Charlton Heston, yeah. So. <laughs> All right, keys. Darn. You know, my first key. Uh, you can't deny just, this movie has keys. Uh, yeah. The, my first one would be The Shining. Just because it starts the same way. We meet our nuclear family. It's a husband, wife, and a boy. They're having troubles, yada, yada. And they're going to have to be here for the the rest of the night. And I think this predates Shining. So I wonder if Stephen kind of was inspired by Burnt before that. That's Dance one of my biggest things is that Stephen King kind of ripped this book off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. Ben is even a writer. That can't mm-hmm. write when he's yep. there. And you have, like you said, uh, um, I mean, I know Stephen King didn't do the movie, but the whole driving up is very similar to the Kubrick film where they're all driving up to the mm-hmm. hotel. Um, and and basically it is, and, and he's not the first to do this because I have another key, but the house is an entity that basically sucks the life out of people, which is, the Stephen King shining all the way, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, um, I have an earlier key, though. Uh, oh, and and I would like to say that, you know, this is one of Stephen King's favorite, and he cited it in Dance Macabre, so it wasn't like he was trying to shy away from the fact that he was influenced by it, but maybe a little too much. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, my first key was Dead of Night, a movie we covered a season or two back. I think it was like was it last season it was when we were doing anthology last season we did yeah. it last season um there is a short uh, out of the five stories that are in that movie there is a story about a hearse driver that keeps showing up and freaking people out yeah it's the first one yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah so that i think was that's a, a good one a definite one that's a good one um yeah i've got amityville of course the amityville okay. horror not only was it a 70s movie and book and you know sensation kind of thing but it was that kind of haunted house story that everybody remembers mm-hmm. sort of thing that that uh, this is similar to in the fact that it's a haunted house same way with poltergeist i've got poltergeist too just because it's it's another um we're in over our heads in the house kind of haunted house mm-hmm. um this may have inspired King, but I think this guy was inspired by The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. That's mm-hmm. the first novel I remember where they actually refer to the house being an entity itself. Mm-hmm. So I would definitely put Hill House in there. I had that one too because okay. haunting ends with uh, the haunting ends with the death too. It's the boy in in that story because turn of the screw kind of thing, but it's also the the um, you're, you're thinking the of turn of the screw. Yeah, I wanted to add that one. That's mine too. Is the 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 a house being an the there's an entity in the house that requires sacrifice 
I guess is the way I was okay. putting it. Okay, because there's a death That's at the, the end of Hill House, too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You, you confused me there for a second. Sorry. That's all right. Confused myself a lot, too. So there's that. <laughs> Uh, I mentioned uh, the house itself obviously has appeared in a bunch of movies. Um, mm -hmm. One called Little Girls Blue that I don't know. Phantasm, I do know. It was in A View to a Kill. It was in The Vineyard, So I Married an Axe Murderer, and in uh, True Crime. Mm -hmm. So this, this house has been in a lot of movies. Well, and I've also got Phantasm in it because I think it may have influenced him just because of, you know, turn around and see the really tall, scary guy or driving up in the car and the it's a hearse in Phantasm, but in this one it's like an old, old hearse. Um, but uh and then you look away and look back and it disappears, that kind of stuff, being haunted by this dark figure. Mm -hmm. So that was Phantasm. And I've got another king, I've got Rose Red. Which is another okay. haunted house story. Well, I mean, yeah, any haunted house story, pretty much. Um, but that one was like this in the fact that the house was gaining energy from the people in mm -hmm. it. Feeding you on know. them. Yeah. Yeah. Feeding on fear, which is also it when you think about it. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how to phrase this as a key, but... Mm -hmm. Everyone in this cast has strong genre ties to horror. <laughs> oh, yeah. I would agree with that. You have Oliver Reed, who got a start in Hammer movies. You have Karen mm -hmm. Black, who became sort of a staple on television horror in the 70s. Mm -hmm. You have Betty Davis, who I was saying graduated to genre when she was too old to get cast in anything else. You have Burgess mm -hmm. Meredith, who's done famous episodes of The Twilight Zone. And you have mm -hmm. Eileen Eckhart, who was in The Bad Seed. <laughs> that's a, that's mm -hmm. a lot of, I don't know, symbiotic Prestige horror genre cast. energy yeah. <laughs> going yeah. on there. <laughs> I wonder well, if I, I tapped into that as a kid, like <laughs> subconsciously. Ooh, this you might is going to be a good movie because look who's in it. <laughs> yeah. I've uh, got two that are director keys. In other words, the shot okay. or the scene reminded me of another scene sort of thing that may have influenced. And it's a uh, Evil Dead when he's trying to fight the tree and suddenly the vines grab hold of his legs and start oh, pulling. Oh, yes. Him. I forgot about that. Mm hmm. Yeah. And then I mentioned it already when, you know, he, Oliver Reed's care, Ben might as well have been saying, Mrs. Bates, Mrs. Bates, before he turns her around and she's, you know, staring up at him with the eyes and all that. Yeah. It both of those are psycho. great keys. I don't know why I didn't write them down because they are like shot keys. Like you said, you see the oh, yeah. shot of the vines wrapping around his ankle. You see the shot mm -hmm. of him spinning the chair around, both of them <laughs> straight out of those movies. <laughs> straight out of each of those yeah uh, that's one predating and one post dating but that mm -hmm. sort of thing yeah oh that's right because the uh and and you sam used later. that trick yeah. of filming it backwards or something or reversing yeah. the film yeah mm -hmm. reverse the film well, yeah um that's pretty much all i have i mean i have uh, I, I I think, like I said, the importance of this movie is that it was it was influenced to me by a very a landmark in the genre, which would be Shirley Jackson's Haunting Hill House. But then yes. it went on to influence another landmark in the genre, which is The Shining. It's the mm -hmm. little film in between the two big ones that not many people remember. It's like you've got this great sandwich and it's the soggy little piece of lettuce in between the bread. <laughs> Yes, I think that, <laughs> Does that, make analogy sense? Is, that analogy is perfect. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but I like it still. I, I don't throw it out. I will still eat the sandwich. <laughs> you will still eat the sandwich with the right. soggy lettuce. Yes. There and and I would go on to, like I said, I, I don't think it's something worthwhile of like the thousand and one movies you must see before you die. But I would recommend mm -hmm. this movie any day. I love this movie. Well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. We <laughs> Tim would recommend. I probably would not, but uh, I think that we would love to know what you guys think. 
out there. So if you uh, like burnt offerings or didn't like burnt offerings, leave a comment down below and let us know why or what you think or where we're right or where we're wrong. We love to talk to you guys about it. And again, like we said earlier, we would suggest you subscribe to the YouTube network channel. That way uh, you can get updates on when we release new things. We would love for you to visit our website and see all of our past catalog of movies we have covered over the past five years and things that we have done and even many series. We actually, speaking of Mike Flanagan, we actually did episode by episode The Haunting of Hill House on mm -hmm. our podcast. So um, that would be something for you guys to go back and explore. We also have a Patreon. If you guys would like to support us and help us keep doing this, we would love it. Um, you can get special content there in addition to other podcasts that we are doing. Um, the X-Files Declassified and The Dilithium Chamber, which is classic Star Trek. So we would love to have you support us in that way uh and if as always if you go to itunes even if you don't go to itunes a lot if you could go to itunes and leave us a review there it has a broad outreach and lets other people like us find each other and let us start talking so we would love to increase the community that way uh tim next next week do we get scary or, or are we going more more my genre what are we doing we're doing both something fun we're doing both. Okay, great. So <laughs> we're doing scary science fiction next week. Uh, next week is another Redux episode. Ooh, that's another thing we're doing too, because people <laughs> have requested it and stuff. We're doing Reduxes. We're also doing, um, every year now, we are doing Reader's Choice, our Listener's Choice. So you guys let us know something you want us to <laughs> You said cover. Reader's Choice again. <laughs> I know. I always say readers, listeners, viewers, why. whatever, either um, if you see us on YouTube or you hear us on the podcast airwaves, uh, let us know a movie you want us to do. We've picked three yes. from random people out there this season, and we're going to do it again next season. So, yep. And until next time, Tim, I guess we'll uh, we'll see you next week. All righty. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Start the car, Johnny.